In a protected forest on the southern edge of the Amazon lives an astonishing array of animals. 50% of all Amazon bird species. Sleepy giant otters, smelly peccaries, and its greatest ambassador, the spider monkey. Here, life plays out in the oldest tropical forest on the planet, under the watchful eyes of scientists eager to uncover its secrets. Brazil, a land of many habitats and many creatures. From the coast to the high forests of its mountains and across the savanna, Brazil has so many species it's considered one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. Here, at the southern edge of the Amazon, rare and fascinating creatures claim the treetops. Agile acrobats, whose lanky limbs and long prehensile tails make them masters of this world. They're white-whiskered spider monkeys. They rarely come down to the forest floor, preferring to spend most of their time in the upper canopy, near the sun and the fruits they love to eat. Their long tails grasp branches so they can dangle or fly through the canopy. The underside of the tip of their tail is hairless and has wrinkles and ridges which helps in gripping branches. Another revolutionary adaptation is the almost complete absence of a thumb. Scientists used to think this was a primitive characteristic, but not anymore. Paolo Suarez is a biologist. She spent 10 months observing the white-whiskered spider monkeys as part of her studies. When you talk about the scientific name, it means imperfect only because it, uh, the person who described it, the animal saw that they didn't have the opposable thumb, which makes us, in our uh, idea, look perfect. But actually, it's a perfection that evolution brought to the genus so they can look better. The lack of thumb is an adaptation that's evolved over time as spider monkeys became specialized canopy dwellers. The monkey's four remaining fingers are curved together like a hook which makes it easier to grab and swing from branch to branch. There are seven different species of spider monkeys. White-whiskered spider monkeys only live in a small part of the Amazon rainforest. They've been affected by habitat loss and are now endangered. But in this patch of forest, things are different. And the interesting thing here is that they don't feel threatened, so they don't run away. If you go look for spider monkeys in places where you have deforestation and hunting, these animals are probably gonna run free when they run pretty fast. Nobody here is gonna hunt them. Nobody here is gonna kill the forest that they live on. This place is special because it's a protected private reserve. More than 28,000 acres of undisturbed old forest have been set aside.
Vittoria da Riva Carvalho's family has lived here since the early 1970s. They were pioneers. In 1992, she established an ecotourism lodge and then turned it into the Cristalino Private National Heritage Reserve, a pristine sanctuary that hosts many scientific and educational conservation projects. Muita, muita ciência está, está atrás desse projeto porque é, você não pode preservar o que você não conhece. Então, não se conhecia nada do sul da Amazônia. Então, nós começamos a trazer pesquisadores de muitas áreas, de mamíferos, de aves e de borboletas e inúmeros que chegaram. The reserve is the perfect refuge for these endangered Amazon monkeys. There is a subgroup of seven individuals. There is a female with an infant. And the female with the infant is just like, resting. And maybe some males. Some of them interacting. Like most monkeys, they are social and live in a troop. The troop is composed of 15 to 25 males, females, babies, and juveniles. But they're rarely all together at the same time. The troop divides into smaller subgroups during the day, especially during the dry season, when food is harder to find. Scientists call this fission fusion. They shake the branches just to show some territorial behavior. It's just behavior to show who really lives here and it's not me. More than 80% of their diet is fruits, but there are no fruits for these two females and their babies today. So they settle for green leaves. Perhaps the females sense a change in the forest air. A cool dampness that tells them the dry season is about to end. When the rains come, the trees will bear fruit again. That time is not far away. There are only two seasons in the rainforest, the wet and the dry. Nine species of monkeys live within the private reserve, and they all need to make the most of the extremes of these two seasons. There's rarely any aggressive interaction between species, and they'll often share the same tree. Like this spider monkey, who has a curious young visitor, a sake monkey. It's one of the most elusive and little understood primates in the rainforest. The white-nosed bearded sake monkeys might be shy and cautious, but when it comes to moving through the treetops, they're the daredevils of the rainforest. Some call them flying monkeys. With powerful hind legs, the sakis can run upright along the branches and make 30-foot jumps between trees.
Oh, the sexy monkey. That there is like a very characteristic behavior of them. They just rest there with their tails like hanging. Um, and this species is in danger because people you kill them to get their tails for cleaning the houses, like um, little brooms to take off the dust. There are so many species living in the Amazon rainforest that scientists are still finding new ones. Some are endemic and are only found in the Amazon. They include Saki and the white-whiskered spider monkey. Others can be found through much of South and Central America, like the capuchin monkey. And according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the loudest land animals in the world, the howler monkey. Their roaring howls can be heard three miles away. The secret to the howler's big noise is the shape of its hyoid bone. The bone creates a sort of resonance chamber that makes their calls really ring out. Their long distance calls send a clear message to the neighborhood. Beware, this is my territory. This mother and her baby are right at the edge of another troop's territory. In their search for fruit, they ventured far from their group. It's worth the risk, as ripe fruits are hard to find at this time of year. They're a tasty addition to this leaf eater's usual diet. It's a long way down from the canopy of this 100-year-old Brazil nut tree, from the bright green world of the monkeys to the dark shadows of the forest floor. This is the understory, a world unto its own, a distinct layer of the rainforest that lies below the canopy and only a few feet above the forest floor. It's a hot, damp tangle of shrubs, young trees, palms, and woody plants that grow and flourish in the shade of the taller trees. Many of the plants in the understory have evolved large, flat leaves to absorb as much sunlight as possible. The spiders, insects, and other animals that occupy this shady world have found many ways to live and thrive. The Amazon rainforest is thought to be the oldest tropical forest in the world. And ants have lived and worked here from the very beginning. One of the most industrious and ingenious species is the leafcutter ant. These are the forest's farmers. They've harvested leaves, and they're transporting them to their underground farm, where they use them to fertilize a crop of fungus. The ants cultivate the fungus to feed their giant colony that can number from several hundred thousand to eight million ants. 
Leafcutter ants have one of the most complex social systems of the natural world, with a labor force and a social hierarchy rivaled by none except humans. The smaller ants catching a ride on the leaves are called minims. They drink the sap from the edges of the leaves and protect the workers from parasitic wasps looking for a place to lay their eggs. Ants can support up to 5,000 times their body weight. The colony is tucked away deep in the forest and it will be a long walk for this battalion of ants. Ants are among the most diverse, abundant, and ecologically significant organisms on Earth. They make up a quarter of the entire terrestrial animal biomass on the planet. There are many ant species in the rainforest, and they're all specialists. This ant looks like it's chasing off an intruder, but it isn't. The apparent intruder is a tree hopper, the parent of the white nymphs the ants are tending. The tree hoppers and the ants have a special relationship called mutualism. The ants protect the nymphs, which in turn provide a crop of sugary honeydew as a tasty payment. A win-win situation. It's dark down on the forest floor. Only 2% of sunlight filters through to this bottom layer. Only plants and fungi adapted to low light level are able to survive here. But this warm and humid layer is home to a huge number of decomposers, dead things. Leaves, branches, and animals decay quickly. It's also home to one of the smelliest animals in the forest. So stinky, their scent arrives before they do. They are white-lipped peccaries. Although they look like pigs or hogs, they belong to a different family group. But just like pigs, peccaries will eat almost anything. Seeds, roots, bird eggs, lizards, and even soil. Their smell comes from a special musk gland located on their rumps. They use it to identify other herd members and to mark their territories. This herd of peccaries is returning to one of its favorite places, a salt lick. The peccaries come here so often, trampling the earth and vegetation as they root around for salts and minerals, they've created a permanent clearing on the rainforest floor. Rainforests are lush up above, but the soil is poor in nutrients, so the peccaries need to add salt to their diet of fruits and leaves to maintain healthy bone and muscle growth. And they get other important minerals by eating the soil. After a good lick of salt and a few mouthfuls of jungle dirt, there's no better way to relax in the peccary spa than a massage and a rub down from a loving mate or a good friend. Peccaries are a favorite food for many rainforest predators, so they are always on the alert. Acute hearing is finely tuned to the sounds of approaching danger.
and even the faintest rustle of leaves sends the herd packing. Peccaries are creatures of habit and are territorial. With a last satisfying roll in the mud, this one marks the spot with his powerful scent, a squirt from the musk gland on the back of his rump. Once the rambunctious peccaries are gone, it doesn't take long for the salt lick to attract some much smaller, lighter, salt-loving customers. Butterflies. Researcher Luisa Santiago spends many months in the reserve to observe this beautiful and diverse group of rainforest insects. This one is Marpesia chirum, or chirum dagger ring, common name. Um, it's probably the most common uh, butterfly here in the Salero. Salero is Portuguese for salt lick, and butterflies also need their minerals. They need salt for their metabolism. And so they, they search for these thoughts in the, in the ground, just as the peccaries do. <laughs> Mostly male butterflies belong to the Rainforest Salt Lick Club. Female butterflies usually prefer to get their salt from the nectar of plants and flowering trees. But the males are so salt crazy that the first male butterfly to find a salty spot becomes a magnet to every passing male of the same species. And soon, hundreds, even thousands of male butterflies jam the salt licks. They have a special technique for collecting and processing their salt lick cocktails. It's called mud puddling. They suck up moisture from the damp ground, then pump the water through their bodies and extract the minerals. They excrete the filtered water back onto the ground, where it can dissolve more minerals, which can then be re-imbibed. So far, 1,576 species of butterflies and moths have been identified within the 44 square miles of this protected forest. On this trip alone, Louisa has identified 70 species. That's more than in the entire United Kingdom, which has only about 59 species of butterflies. Butterflies are a metaphor for change, for changing from something um, ugly that people do not like very much, such as the caterpillars, into something that is very beautiful, very delicate, and that can fly and that everybody admires.
a river snakes through this patch of forest. It's the Cristalino River, and it eventually flows into the Amazon River. This six-mile stretch of river has been claimed by a giant otter family. The water level is so low, fishing is easy. Each otter needs to eat six to nine pounds of fish every day. And although they hunt together, each otter catches and consumes its own prey. No sharing. They have webbed feet, water repellent fur to keep them dry and warm, and nostrils and ears that close underwater. The otters know how to relax after dining. But even when they're drying out on a fallen Brazil nut tree in the hot tropical sun, they're always on guard. The big alpha male positions himself highest on the log, facing the riverbank, keeping an eye out for the first sign of danger. Jaguars roam these forests. The mother keeps tabs on her young one with a gentle touch of her long, powerful tail. Chances are this otter family has seen some hard times this year. Most families normally have four cubs. Three may have already been killed. With Luck and his parents' watchful eyes, this only cub will survive and strike out on his own soon. Their days of basking in the sun next to a slow-moving river will soon be over. The heavy rains that herald the beginning of the wet season are fast approaching. Every day, the trees of the Amazon rainforest, the largest tropical rainforest on the planet, release 22 billion tons of water vapor into the sky. This water vapor gathers in airborne streams, a vast atmospheric river known as the Rio Voador, literally a flying river. The clouds carry the water down to southern Brazil and as far as northern Argentina. It's an upside-down irrigation system. In the downpour, some white-whiskered spider monkeys find shelter under the thick canopy. The females and their young huddle together. Like humans, they don't like to get wet. They'll stay here until the deluge passes, or until they get hungry again whichever comes first.
the heavy seasonal rains are the lifeblood of all the layers of the rainforest. On the forest ground, the thin soil has already absorbed much of the rainwater. A hawk moth takes advantage of an isolated puddle. After the rain subsides, the spider monkeys leave their shelter and start foraging for fruit. They're messy eaters, which makes them important seed dispersers. They have ripe fruits because it's the early rainfall, like the rains are starting. And they usually fall on the ground. So we can see they're falling now because they're just eating the whole fruit. Now that the wet season has begun, different spider monkey subgroups are reuniting and merging into larger groups. They separated earlier in the dry season as a way to avoid conflict when food was scarce. They do this to avoid intraspecific competition since they have less resources, so they don't fight between each other for them, they just split. The beginning of the wet season is good news for the white-nosed sake monkeys as well. Most of their diet is also fruit. But they'll eat almost anything they can get their hands on, including flowers, insects, leaves, and even rodents and bats. Sakis typically live in large groups of 8 to 20 individuals, mostly with equal numbers of males, females, and juveniles. Curiously, Adult male sakis prefer to spend most of their time with other males. The males tend to stick together, grooming, body rubbing, tail wagging each other, and unless mating, they generally ignore the females. These social behaviors among males are thought to reduce competition and fighting both for food and mates. The adult female sake spend most of their time caring for the young. The monkeys aren't the only ones using these large trees as shelter. There are more than 1,500 bird species living in the Amazon rainforest. 15 new species were discovered just a few years ago in the southern Amazon. Almost half of these species live in the reserve. This rich abundance is due to the diversity of habitats. From the emergent layer high above the treetops to the canopy. The understory. and the rainforest floor.
Francisco de Carvalho Souza is a local bird specialist at the Cristalino Reserve. Aqui no tem 600 espécies de de aves já registrada. The tools of Francisco's trade are his binoculars and an iPod, which contains hundreds of bird calls. In the dense forest, birds live in a world of sound, and so do the people who want to find them. Francisco uses recorded songs to lure birds like the red-headed mannequins into the open. Ele funciona porque quando você usa de um dançarino, que é o dançarino é, de cabeça vermelha, que esse manequim que é muito comum nessa região nossa aqui, ele vem para defender o território. Então ele responde e imediatamente ele vem ver quem é que tá ali, né? Isso serve como uma um sinal de que tem alguém invadindo o território dele. Birds that answer Francisco's recordings aren't just being friendly. They want to know who's the new bird and what does he want. Like this royal flycatcher, busy building a nest. Is he a threat, or perhaps a potential mate? Some birds attract their mates with a song. Others impress with magnificent colors and fancy footwear. But none comes close to the red-headed mannequin for putting on the best show in the rainforest. The male makes a clicking sound by rubbing and plucking his wingtips together. A bit like a cricket, over a hundred times a second. His feet make the moves. It's a high-energy moonwalk. A high-performance dance that raises the male's heart rate up to an incredible 1,300 beats per minute. But show business isn't for everyone. Some birds prefer to blend in. Patus are a master of disguise. They're nocturnal insect eaters. They choose a perch near dead tree branches during the day. Then hide in plain sight. Thin slits in their upper eyelids let them keep a lookout while their eyes appear to be closed. A female patu rests on a broken tree stump with a camouflaged chick under her camouflaged wing. She didn't build a nest. She incubated her egg on the same perch blending seamlessly into her surroundings. Nocturnal stick insects also use camouflage to avoid detection by predators. But prey species aren't the only ones to use camouflage. Hunters do as well. 
In the dappled shade of the forest, large predators like the jaguar can be surprisingly difficult to see with their disruptive coloration. Some butterflies use another kind of deception. Large eye spots can help butterflies intimidate would-be attackers by resembling a much larger animal. The rivers and streams are a muddy brown, colored when heavy tropical rains wash tons of sediment into the rivers. They slowly wind their way across the flat Amazon basin. Francisco passes a family of giant river otters. These otters are among the toughest mammals in the rainforest. With their big eyes, whiskers, and shiny coats, they may look like friendly puppy dogs. But make no mistake, the giant river otters fear no rainforest predator. When threatened by a jaguar, caiman, or a man in a motorboat, they won't hesitate to defend their territory. danger approaches, they come together, rise up out of the water using their powerful tails, and confront their opponents. Francisco is just passing by. He's not looking for mammals. He's a bird guy and has eyes for those with feathers. Like the little green kingfisher who's got the perfect physique for diving in the rivers and streams, the body of a sparrow, and the long bill of a heron. spots prey, it drops into a steep dive and captures small fish, crustaceans, prawns, and even insects. It takes just a few weeks for a young kingfisher to learn this skill. This female has clearly mastered the art. But a young Agami heron is still in training. Its long neck and long bill are good equipment for catching fish. But it's discovering that fishing takes skill and practice and maybe it can take a few tips from an older bird. The resplendent colors of this agami heron's plumage is an indication of his age and skill level. Agami herons mature when they're about three years old. That's when they're ready to mate. By this age, they're hunting pros. This young heron is still learning, and he's got a few feathers left to grow.
As the young spider monkeys mature and gain their independence, they'll start to develop a mental map of all the fruiting trees in their territory. This knowledge is crucial for their survival, as is the forest itself, which is now protected within this refuge. For Vittoria da Riva Carvalho, the scientific research undertaken at the Cristalino Reserve is just one part of her essential conservation work. When Vittoria created the first private national heritage reserve in Mato Grosso, almost a decade ago, little was known about the Amazon's southern biome, but that is changing. Este empreendimento começou como um sonho. Este foi o início. Hoje em dia, eu sinto bastante orgulho do, do nosso trabalho porque nós estamos preservando e incentivando outras pessoas a preservar e eu procuro fazer uma pequena parte. Quando você faz alguma coisa que você gosta, uma coisa que você sente o valor intrínseco daquilo, é, é tudo, né? Every conservation program needs its ambassador, including the Southern Amazon. Here, the diplomat in chief is the spider monkey. The spider monkey is the flagship species of Crystallina. And what it means is that this species is like almost like the spokesperson or spokes monkey, if you will, for the whole forest since he needs like a well-sustainable forest to exist. I mean, he has um, high needs, he needs fruits, he needs to live in tall evergreen forests. Therefore, if the, if the monkey is preserved, so the whole forest is preserved, and then the whole other animals that live within it. The spider monkeys and the other monkeys living in the forest have nothing to fear. The Cristalino Private National Heritage Reserve is protected and will be the monkey's refuge for many more years to come. <laughs> <laughs>